Our study tonight is a big boy and a big girl study. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 6. Now remember as we read that chapter and verse divisions were not inspired by God. They were put there for men, and that's why verse 16 is important. Verse 16 says this, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, and was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Chapter 4, verse 1. And it might be said, in spite of that, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point out these things, now this is my only motive tonight. Verse 6 is the reason that we're going to be as direct as we're going to be talking about difficult subjects. I want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith, and of the good teaching that you have followed. Father, <clears throat> as we begin tonight, prepare our hearts to hear how important it is not only to believe that which is true, but to hold on for dear life to that which is true. And God, I pray that every man, every woman in this place tonight would resolve that what we want is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, Jesus. If we'll do that, Lord, we'll be okay when these tests and trials come. As always, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this group tonight who isn't yet born again, if they don't know you, they know about you or they wouldn't be here, but if they don't know you, I pray, O oh Lord, that that would change tonight as you add to your family. Finally, Father, in any group this size, there are going to be people here who have been hurt by false teaching. Open their eyes, their hearts, and their minds and help them to trust in you and your perfect word. And may our lives be committed and submitted to you to bring you glory. We love you and we thank you. All of this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the things that was always confusing to me, especially as a new believer, you'd get into the Gospels and Jesus would be uh, telling his disciples uh, about his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection, that he would be coming again. He, he was always throwing those bits of knowledge into his conversations. And yet when he would tell them what was going on, in the world at the end times. They would ask the question, well, well, Lord, when will these things happen? They were just like us. They're curious. They want to know when these things are going to happen. And every time they asked him, Jesus always began with a warning against false prophets. As we get closer and closer to the end, false prophets will prosper. False prophets will abound everywhere we go. Jesus says that's a sign of the end. And we want you to understand tonight that we are surrounded by all kinds of false teachings. And tonight we understand the nature of those false teachings. Now keep in mind, Timothy is being written to, he is in Ephesus. It was in Ephesus, you can read about it in Acts chapter 20, where Paul in his emotional farewell to the Ephesian elders, he said to them, I know that savage wolves will come among you or come in from among you your own number to devour the flock of God. And all of those elders 
that were there to say goodbye to the Apostle Paul, their hearts broken. They would think, well, certainly it's not going to be us. Well, as Paul writes Timothy, who is the pastor in Ephesus, Timothy is starting to deal with these very issues. As we get near and near the end, we need to understand how important doctrine is, how important it is to hold on to the truth once for all delivered to the saints. That means that truth is never going to be changed. It's never going to be modified. And we can't let it be compromised in our own lives. He says in verse 16, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. Now, if you remember our last study in chapter 3, we learned that the church was the pillar and foundation of the truth. Without the truth, and we talked briefly about that moment when the church is raptured out of here, and darkness completely consumes the world. There's no more restraining of evil. Well, it's because the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And that's why we in the church have the responsibility, the sacred responsibility, to protect the truth, to guard the truth with all that is within us. Now, the mystery of godliness is great. We're going to talk about some of the essentials, things that we need to hold on to. Now, this is not a comprehensive list of essential Christian doctrines. But in the context of this letter, Timothy, keep doing what you're doing. What follows is almost certainly a hymn that was well known in the early church. To help people remember things, they put it to music just like we do now. And so this is something they would sing at their worship gatherings. It's a hymn that connects the need for good local leadership in the church that we've talked about up to this point in 1 Timothy and the directions for order in the church that will follow in the next chapter. Now to us, Jesus is no mystery. Now there's a lot about him that we don't understand, but we get it. Jesus, God incarnate, he died for our sins. He paid the price for your sins and mine. And we need to hold on to that. And so often in this world, we're confronted with people, I don't know why he had to die, or I don't believe he was really God, never said he was God. We need to understand and value that truth with every fiber of our being. As a born-again believer here tonight, a Friday night message, you're familiar with these things. So you have a head start on the unbelieving world. So let's unravel this mystery together. The first says that he appeared in his body. Now I don't have time tonight to do a complete study on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I wish I did. It is a valuable and study it yourselves. Literally this is that he appeared in flesh. It's, it's the carnal word that we get carnal from. Jesus appeared in the flesh. He was born in this world as a human. He died in this world as a human. And he was subject to all the things in this world that every other human who's ever lived has been subject to. Think about it this way. He got hungry. God got hungry. Oh, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to turn into bread. And that was Satan trying to trap him and trick him. He got hungry. He got tired. He got angry. Not like us. He got righteously angry. He was heartbroken. He wept. You'll remember at the tomb of Lazarus. I, I can imagine Jesus thinking, this isn't the way I made things. I made things to be perfect. Jesus, God in flesh, was loved. We like that part. But he was hated as well and murderously so. He was taken seriously by some and dismissed as a nut by others. And I use that word purposely because even his own family believed that he was out of his mind at times. God in human flesh, God who lives outside of time and space, who knows everything, he was a man acquainted with sorrow and grief, a man tempted in all ways just like other men. And for me personally, this is probably the most mysterious thing of all. Why would he subject himself to all of that? Well, the mystery 
is that he did it for you and he did it for me. If you read the parable of the pearl of great price, God makes it clear that if there was only one person who would have believed, it was just me or if it was just you, he still would have died. That's how valuable you are. That's the essential that you always have to hold on to. Never let anybody shake you from that. You know, it's easy for people to say, and it's always the hiss of the serpent, well, if God loved you, why would you be hurting or why would you be suffering? Why would things be going the way they are? We need to understand this is the pillar. This is the foundation of the truth for you and for me. He loves you. He's crazy about you. And if he hadn't finished his course, a perfect man, a sinless man had to die for our sins to be forgiven. He did it for you and he did it for me. Well, how do we know it was good? Well, that's the next part of this mystery. It says he was vindicated by the Spirit. Now, he was vindicated wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. He was vindicated in life. He was vindicated by the power of the Holy Spirit through signs and wonders. By his teaching, nobody ever spoke like this man did. Nobody could do the things that he did if he wasn't from God. Jesus would say to his rejectors, at least believe on the basis of what you've seen me do, the signs and the wonders. Still people tried to attribute his miracles to the devil, but they couldn't deny the power that he was vindicated by, but he was also vindicated in death by his resurrection from the dead. That is the stamp, stamp of authenticity that everything Jesus claimed to be, everything that he said he would do for you and for me, he did. And because he did, we live. It says he was seen by angels. Now the point here, I think, is that his death and resurrection was not a secret. There were a lot of eyewitnesses, human eyewitnesses, but better than that is the eyewitness testimony of angels. Truth, from the very beginning in the Old Testament, was established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And of course, the amount, the number of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection was overwhelming. And I think we'd agree that angels make pretty reliable witnesses. We have to make no apologies to anyone about believing the truth. Then this is this, and this is kind of where we take over in these last days. He was preached among the nations. You know, it's amazing how quickly word spread about Jesus' resurrection. I mean, on the first day of the church, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 men, not counting wives, and some children, they got saved. 5,000 more men got saved a few days later. This affirms his command then and now for us to preach the gospel to every creature, to every nation. And from that time, the Lord continues to add daily to the church, such as are being saved. From Acts chapter 2. It says he was believed on in the world. Now, the whole world doesn't believe in him, but they know about him. And the evidence has been absolutely overwhelming. And that's why this mystery has spread to every part of the world. And the best question that unbelievers have to deal with is, why is this one man change the lives of so many people dramatically and wonderfully? Well, the answer is given by Paul in the first chapter of Romans. It, the gospel itself, is the power of God unto salvation. And then it says, and he was taken up in glory. Now remember, these are essentials. These are the things that we have to hold on to and we can't let go. It doesn't matter what anybody comes in and says about them. These are things that we have to hold on to. And it says he was taken up in glory. Now we know there were 500 witnesses of his ascension. His ascension, we sometimes forget it, his death and his resurrection, all that's great, and it is. But he was also ascended into heaven to take his proper place at the right hand of the throne in heaven. He was sin taken up in glory so that you and I could be taken up in glory when we die or when we're raptured 
as well. And this is a mystery that we need to protect, a mystery that we need to value with all of our lives, with all of our strength. We don't have to understand it all, but every one of us can receive it all. Now, that mystery, we are the pillar and foundation of the truth. That is the truth. That's the foundation that we build upon. But Paul now says we have to be on guard against those who will come in and try to steal what we know is true from us. He says in this warning, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some of your translations say latter times, L-A-T-T-E-R, and that's better because this is a look to the end of times, but we also need to understand what the latter times mean, the last days, always is a reference from that time between Jesus' ascension into heaven and his resurrection, or his return, rather, to the earth that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. It's the time between Jesus' first and second coming. These are the last days or the latter times that we live in. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, highlight the word abandon. Some of your translations use different words, but the assumption here is these are professing Christians. You know, you don't abandon the faith that you never had. So he's telling Timothy, Timothy, these things are going to happen. People that you think are saved are going to turn away from God. They're going to turn away from everything that they once believed. They're going to deny the things that they once knew were true. They're going to deny the miraculous if they've seen any of the miraculous. They're going to abandon the faith and they're going to follow deceiving spirits. The idea here is that they're going to be enticed by deceiving spirits. And make no mistake, Calvary Chapel, deceiving spirits are all around us. Some of them are here tonight in this place. One thing I've learned from a long time of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you're talking about false teaching and deceiving spirits, the enemy's upset. And he's always going to be whispering in your, did God really say? That's been the lie from the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, when everything was perfect, oh, surely you won't die. You must have misunderstood God. Well, these are deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, in these few verses, we're going to learn four things about false teachers and their teachings. And I think these things, I hope these things will be obvious to all of you. The first is that false teachers are tools of the devil. They're tools of the devil. Now, one of the problems with the devil is he will mix in a lot of scripture with the lies. A lot of truth, a little lie, and it's easy to deceive us. False teachers are tools of the devil. Even though Paul is speaking about the latter times, the yet future, the last days, here he moves into the present tense in Greek, and I mention that because it indicates that Paul knew that the last days had already begun. And that was nearly 2,000 years ago. We have a tendency to think the well, last days, Jesus coming soon. We've been hearing that as long as I've been a Christian. Well, it's been longer than that. But you see, we're to live our lives as though he's coming back tonight. We're one week away, one week from tomorrow is joy of Jesus. And we might not be here for joy of Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be a joyful Jesus day for us. <laughs> but the idea here is Paul knew that they were in the last days. And he was trying to equip Timothy. What I'm trying to do is to equip each and every one of you to expect these things so that you're not caught off guard. People were already abandoning the true faith. The devil is always in a hurry. He knows his time is short. This falling away began within 30 or so years of Jesus' death and resurrection. And people were already denying what they knew. Now, we all know people who at least we thought were believers. They started out well. Some of them got emotional. Some of them served the Lord seemingly fruitful for a time. And then we wonder what happened to him. We don't see him at church. And later we run into him and they completely abandon the faith. 
And we wonder, well, what, what happened? Did they lose their salvation? Remember our study from 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us because they were never really a part of us. Now, that's hard for us. And certainly we're not to go around shining bright flashlights and people say, are you really a believer? But perseverance, persisting in what we know is true, is a sign of a true believer. Now, in the world that we live in, liberal theologians, and when I say a liberal theologian, I'm not speaking politically at all. It's just those who don't believe that the Word of God is the Word of God. And they kind of make Jesus into whoever they want Him to be. They hate any notion that the Bible is actually, literally true. And they make fun of those of us who do believe that. we got to be tough enough to take that. You know, we get a guy who's got a master's of divinity or a doctorate of divinity behind his name and he's on TV and they're interviewing him and he sounds so intelligent and he explains, and this happens especially around Easter every year, why the Bible isn't literally true and why these things didn't really happen and this was really an allegory for this or for that. And we've got to say, I don't care how smart he sounds, or how many letters are behind his name. We have to remember that a fool says in his heart, there's no God. Those theologians, we see it all around us. We see the professing church ordaining homosexual men and women, allowing them in the pulpit, telling everybody it's okay, do whatever you want. Those people are following deceiving spirits. And they try to make it seem as though those of us who believe the word of God is literally God's word and true. They make us feel like we're silly and uneducated and maybe worst of all, unsophisticated. Now, one of the statements here that is staggering to me is that demons evidently have their own theology as I think most of you know we are, are getting ready in our new facility when we can get that going uh, to have a Bible college can you imagine that somewhere in the spirit realm there's a demon Bible college how to distort the Bible read the screw tape letters they evidently have their own theology and it takes all forms some of it, not a lot of it, but some of it deals with the essentials of our faith, while some of the other doctrines deal with the issues of life, living. For example, and we're going to run into this next, legalism is a doctrine of demons. That's the specific context. But we have other demon-inspired doctrines. Prosperity teaching is a doctrine of demons. Name it and claim it. If you just believe it, you can be it. Those are demons of doctrines, and they're very wildly popular, in fact. Limited atonement. Jesus didn't really die for everybody. He died only for the elect. That is a demonic doctrine. And there are many, many more of those demonic doctrines, and they have occurred in every church in every church age, and we are not immune, even here at Calvary Chapel. Now, before moving on, there's a second warning that I think we all need to hear in this first verse. And this is the real tragedy. False teachers, we can deal with them, but the problem is that they lead people astray. People that God loves, people for whom he died, people for whom he has a wonderful plan, and the devil has his false teachers there to lead them astray. We want to walk in the perfect, pleasing, and acceptable will of God. Satan doesn't want us to walk in that will. And so demons are actively roaming through the earth with these destructive doctrines trying to lead people astray. The spirits are deceiving. If you have a King James, it's a better word. It is seducing. And all we have to do is think about Eve being seduced in the Garden of Eden. 
That's all he does. This is so much better. This is so much easier. If you listen to me, then you can do this or do that. And all those things that the Bible tells you you can't do, you don't have to listen to those things. All of these demonic doctrines are subtle and they are effective because they're attractive to our flesh. I've said to you many times that the devil is clever and that he is also persistent And there's not a single man or woman here who is immune from being seduced by these demonic doctrines. Paul will tell Timothy later, watch your life and doctrine closely. As your pastor, I've tried to communicate to you over the years to watch your life and doctrine closely. And people say, well, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can, but I really don't have time to study the Bible If you don't watch your doctrine closely, your life won't be one that pleases the Lord. Your life won't be consistent. You'll be tossed to and fro, to use the Bible's language, following every wind and wave of doctrine. Doctrine matters. You need to know what you believe. You need to know why you believe it. And once you believe it, remember, I'm going to repeat from earlier, this is the faith once for all, delivered to the saints. It never changes. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. Never forget that. You know, these deceiving spirits, they purposely sound so Christian. A little lie mixed with a lot of truth. And we think, well, you know, that's pretty close. I've actually had people say regarding false teachers here in our area, Well, you know, 80% of what he says is right on. Is there anybody here who wants to drink water with 80% water and 20% poison? We need to understand how important it is to be warned. We remember Paul's admonition in the last chapter. We, the church, are the pillar and foundation of the truth. We need to know the devil will stop at nothing in order to chip away at that truth. The third thing we need to know about false teachers is that they are willful liars. Look at verse 2. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now the word seared is the word that we get our English word cauterized from. I think you all get that. It's like putting a brand on a on a cattle or something and the sound it makes just but but their consciences are seared I don't know if any of you have ever seen Kenneth Copeland or Creflo Dollar their consciences are seared Jesse Duplantis T.D. Jakes their consciences are seared and you know we'll turn to Christian TV or Christian radio and we'll listen to them And many times we're not even in our Berean mode. You know, let's check out what they say. It's like, well, you know, it's kind of exciting. They're certainly more exciting than Pastor Ron. (laughs) Everybody's more exciting than Pastor Ron. (laughs) But their consciences are seared. They know what they're doing is a lie. They know that the miracles that they proclaim are false. They know they're putting on a show. They know that human beings, Christians, because we're gullible, are going to pay them a lot of money to do it. How can they distort the truth of the word of God? It's easy. It doesn't even bother them. Their hearts are so hard that they don't have any remorse or feel any guilt at all. Be careful who you listen to. Now, it's unusual that I name names from here. But remember, and there are a hundred names I could mention. But remember, we started in the first chapter of this book with Paul calling out two of those men, Hymenius and Alexander. We need to know who's good and who's not. Today I had a question on the radio show. Uh, I've, I've never had this particular, but they wanted my, I think we said my highly elevated opinion of three people and all three people I was just kind of holding my breath as I was reading because I didn't want to to barf all over the radio 
And all three guys are fine. All three guys were great. But see, there was a man who asked that question who wanted to be on guard. Before I listened to him, and evidently he's been listening to me for a long time, before I listened to him, is it going to be okay? We need to be able to discern. Test the spirits, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says, because not every spirit is from God. They are willful liars, and their consciences have been seared. And fourth, these false teachers, one of their motives is to restrict your freedom. Now, the issues we're going to deal with are issues that Timothy was having to deal with. But there's dozens of other issues in our church culture as well. And I think by talking about these two issues, you'll get an idea what false teachers are going to do. Verse 3 says, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. That wasn't just the early church. Now, the early church, because it was Jewish exclusively for a long time, they had all kinds of restrictions. You can't do this. You can't eat this. You have to be circumcised. All those things. Well, it wasn't just the first century church. Every church in every century since has been attacking the freedom that believers had. It was a common issue. It remains a common issue, but it is also a very serious matter. Now, these two for our church culture may not sound like very important issues or doctrines. They're certainly not essential doctrines, but they are important. In the early church, people would say things like, well, you know, if you marry and you get involved with sex, you know, you'd be much holier just to avoid it altogether. If you're single, avoid sex. But for everybody else, sex was a gift given by God. And if you're taking notes, write this down. It's a good gift. And we are to be able to enjoy it. Now, we can look around at the church culture that we live in. We're going to talk about food here, and we're talking about sex. The Catholic Church forbids their priests and their nuns to marry. And they've done that from the beginning. I grew up, certainly not in a, a Christian home, and, and very little knowledge of, of religious things. But I wondered why every Friday in the school cafeteria we had fish. And that's the culture many of you came from. And somehow not eating meat made you more spiritual. Not having sex made you holier. Those things aren't true. And we who are Christians, and please, please understand this, we have to allow anything that God doesn't forbid, but we also can't forbid anything that God allows. We need to worry about our own walk with the Lord. Our responsibility is to do what it takes to get closer to the Lord. And this idea that we can do more stuff, we can appear to be more pious and righteous, and somehow that will get us to heaven or that will please the Lord. Well, that is a doctrine that's demonic that flies in the face of the doctrines of grace. You know, both food and sex are fleshly appetites. And God has given us these appetites. They're supposed to be received with thanksgiving. Why? Because we believe and because we know the truth. Now, clearly, both of them can be abused. We can eat way too much, and we can have sexual relationships that have nothing whatsoever to do with being married. We talked about that for two Sundays in our Romans chapter 1 study. Both of those things can be abused, but because there are people that abuse them, we don't want to let people steal the joy of enjoying those appetites that the Lord has given. Think about Peter at the household of Cornelius. Before he goes there, he's on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner, and this sheet comes down from heaven and is filled with all kinds of unclean foods, and he hears the voice from heaven saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
Oh, no, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever come past these lips. I'm not going to start now. He's saying, I'm a good Jewish boy. Remember what he was told? Don't call anything unclean that I have declared to be clean. And Peter understood he was talking about food. At least he thought he understood. He really wasn't talking about food at all because Peter was on his way to Cornelius, a Gentile, and Jews weren't even permitted to go into their home. Would you have loved to see the look on Peter's face the first time he ate a piece of bacon? I don't know about you, but I am really thankful for bacon. I've got a sign in my office that says, I love you more than I love bacon. That's a compliment. <laughs> but God gives us these things to enjoy. Now, let me be a little less humorous here because we do a lot of things to try to justify ourselves before God. Probably every Christian in this room at one time or another has cried out to God, I know I don't pray enough, I know I don't read enough, I know I don't study enough, I know I don't go to church enough, I know I don't serve enough. And so we resolve to do all of those things and we work so hard at it. And you know the reality is we find we're no closer to God and we end up giving up. What we're to do is to Receive those opportunities with thanksgiving, with a sense of privilege. Many of you, if you haven't been to a joy of Jesus before, you're going to see next Saturday what a joy it is to watch God move and to be a participant in it. It's just one of the things that blows people's minds the first time they come. I can't believe, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe this. I got to lead somebody to the Lord. You see, we receive what God has given us with thanksgiving. Demonic doctrines always have more sinister motives. The false teachers want to control us. In our church culture, the false teachers want our money. They're trying to take from you so that they can live a life of luxury. And they justify it with those seared consciences. Anything that gives you the impression that I can do something more that will make me acceptable to God is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Serving God is an honor. It's a privilege. It should be filled with joy. You know, three of the sisters who meddled in the cross-country race set in Austin yesterday, today, I guess it is today. Um, they've been cleaning in this church since they were smaller than the vacuums that they push around. And you should see the fun they have doing it. And they've grown up in this church. And today, they had the opportunity to represent Jesus with hundreds of other kids. The privilege of being different, the privilege of being able to be used by God was overwhelming to them, I am sure. The truth is, please never forget it, that we are accepted in the beloved. God loves you just as much if you never read your Bible as he does when you read it all the time. Isn't it counterintuitive to all of us? Well, no, if I'm doing better, my dad always said, you know, Ronnie, try harder, work harder, and I wanted to make my dad proud of me. Jesus is in heaven yelling, I'm already proud. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he wants us to believe it. The demonic doctrines are designed to steal that from us. God doesn't love you any more or any less, no matter what you do. It's true we can break his heart. It's true that we can be a source of pain for him because we're not doing the things that he knows will bless our lives. It's true that we can quench the work of the Holy Spirit 
imagine that almighty, all-powerful God lives in you. And we humans are the only power on earth that resists him. Even the devils came out of people. But you and I, we can quench the spirit of God. And there's always going to be some false teacher who says, oh, you're fine the way you are. Just, just live your life. God's fine with you. He loves you. But never forget that grace is free. Here's the explanation. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. That's the only criteria. Some people don't want to eat vegetables. You want to eat meat. That's okay. If some people want to... Um, uh, want you to eat vegetables they think you want to eat the way you can say no no I'm fine the way I am whatever I eat I receive with thanksgiving why because it's sanctified or consecrated by the word of God and prayer the question that we need to deal with is how can anything given by God who loves you be anything but perfect every good and perfect gift is from the father of lights we need to know that so you eat your diet, I'll eat my diet. Um, you do what you think is right, I'll do what I think is right. But just remember that Jesus is the goal, the object. Everything God created is wonderful. I want you to note that the last of the tests, here is the condition of your heart. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. If you can receive something with thanksgiving and it's not prohibited in scripture, then it's okay. Romans 14, 23 says, anything not of faith is sinned. Please let that comfort you. Verse 6 actually belongs to the next Bible study, but I included it in this one because we're also told by the Apostle Paul to find out what pleases the Lord. I'm your pastor. And verse 6 is, if you, and I personalize this, every time I walk in the pulpit, if you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. That's what I want for all of you. Let me give you just a little insight into my process Every single time I come to this pulpit, I ask the Lord to help me teach his word in love, with power, with passion, and purpose. And when I get to the purpose part, I say, Lord, your will, not my will, be done. That means I need to hear from you. You know every person who's here. So Lord, help me to teach it in love and with power and with passion and purpose. Thy will, not mine, be done. And then I add these. Help me do it with clarity, with accuracy, with simplicity, and with practicality. And that's my mission. That's my calling in life. And what I want is to be able to hear the Lord say, you know what? You were a pretty good pastor. You did your best. You were faithful. And you were consistent. Now, when we come back next time, you're going to see that verse 6 also applies to you. I'm going to close tonight with this. Nobody, especially me, likes pointing out false teaching or false teachers. Most of us really dislike that kind of conflict. But you have to know what's safe and what isn't. It'd be easy to say, oh, you guys are responsible for your own, you know, I'll teach it. You, but, but that doesn't work. Because there is an enemy who wants to throw you off God's plan. He wants to destroy, he wants to lie, he wants to steal from you. And what I've done now for almost 29, almost 30 years actually, is stand up here and proclaim our faith We haven't changed the way we do anything. I've never come before any of you and said, you know that thing I taught 10 years ago? Hey, I don't believe that anymore. You know, I was reading a book and I almost got convinced that what I was teaching here isn't true, but no, hold 
firm to the truths of Jesus Christ. And when we grow, you know, there are people that will say, you know, if you're not changing, if you're not learning, then you're not really growing in your walk with Jesus Christ. No, no, no. We're to grow in the knowledge of God and of his will for our life. And a God who never changes means the truth never changes. If something was true when I got saved 33 years ago, it's true today. Whatever you know is true. Don't let anyone ever shake you from it. And as you grow, you will be growing in the knowledge of God and of his will for your life. That's what maturity is. In the last days, the Spirit clearly says that there will be deceiving spirits, seducing spirits in demonic doctrines. No one in this room ever needs to be caught in that seductive trap. Can I have the men and women from the pastor's class come forward? <coughs> Father, as we close tonight, I ask very simply, Lord, that you would write in every heart that this unchanging nature of your word is a source of comfort 